God for bringing us on today here on the CJC Power Hour. I'm your neighborhood pastor, Bishop Double O. Anthony Johnson, thanking God for another wonderful day. Somebody ought to clap your hands and just tell God thank you. The fact that we are alive, standing, and I'm not saying, on top, folks say we're standing on top of a grave. I'm not standing on top of a grave. I'm standing in the place where God has placed me on this earth. Praise God. You, you, it's to stand on top of your grave, you're too close to death. I, I, we're not here to die. We're here to live. And I'm going to live until God takes me home. Praise God. And the saints don't die. They sleep. Move on to another dimension of work. So I'm excited to be here online with you today on these various platforms to be broadcasting a word from God to the people of God. And I pray that this word will not return to me void, but it will accomplish where it is sent. So I'm desiring to see that God's people are blessed everywhere. Share this, go on our page, like, share on YouTube, subscribe, so that you can, you can always receive a notification once our program goes live. And you'll be seeing me a lot. I've got to be out there because the devil is busy. And if we don't get busy with the word, we may end up losing some folks who we ought not to have lost because the enemy is sending out his venom and especially to the younger generation that all they know is what they now know. The culture they're living in, uh, the, the surrounding they have, this is what they know. So if we don't live out what we know to be right, they will not know what directions to take. So I'm excited to be bringing to you these broadcasts so that somebody's life may be changed. Today is a day for change because we know that the coming of the Lord is near. I want to pray just a short prayer. I'm not going to be laborious in prayer here, but I just want to pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that Lord, you will touch our children as I'm about to speak your word, Lord God, I pray for your anointing upon the word. But more than your anointing upon the word that I'm about to speak, I pray God that you may touch our children. Every unsaved children in our lives, Lord God, in every mother, every, every father that is online, every unsaved child, Lord God, I pray that you may release a word in their spirit, shatter every plan of the enemy, bring to naught every device of the dragon against their soul. I pray God that you may obliterate principalities and powers set up to destroy them, set up to hold them down, set up to make them a statistic, set up to make them a nothing and a nobody. We obliterate it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Open the eyes of their understanding that they may understand your word and the power of the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray this today. I present it in your hands, Lord. Take full control. In the name of of Jesus Christ and Lord as I'm about to speak your word I pray that you may speak to me and speak through me so therefore Lord let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O Lord my strength and my Redeemer we give you the praise we give you the glory and we say thank you in Jesus Christ's precious name God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Saints, there is so much to be said. Um, sometimes I don't even know where to start because there is so much to be said. But I believe that God is inspiring me to stand as a watchman. He's inspiring me more and more just to stand up and to speak truth. He's even encouraging me not to be discouraged when it comes to speaking truth, because if you don't know what you're doing, uh, the way that the lies are being told, it seems to make the truth not as effective as it ought to be. And those who are speaking truth seems to be afraid of being upfront and bold and being frequent on the airways. 
so that the world will know, in fact, praise God, that Jesus Christ is Lord and what the fundamental principles of the gospel really is. So today I'm going back to the subject as a part three, but I'm, I'm, I'm bringing the series portion to a close, but that's not the end of it. I, I'm closing off this series to move on to another series, but I'm not, it's not because it's the end of it. There's so much more to it. But what I want you to do is to join me on Friday evenings also on Facebook Live, the Church of Jesus Christ Canada Facebook Live, and on the Church of Jesus Christ Canada YouTube page, and also on my personal page, just to be, to hear this series on the, the significance of sound doctrine, sound doctrine. It's very very important for the church today. So I want you to uh, um, uh, remember this and join me on each of these broadcasts for a word that I know God wants to use to transform the world we're living in. Today, as I said, I'm bringing to a close, not the end, but just to close on the series of the wall is broken. Praise God. So I'm going to that message, the wall is broken down. So please stay with me. And I want to deal with um, a very important aspect of it today. Uh, and, and I just want to uh, subtitle this without walls. And um, I noted in Nehemiah chapter 8 and Nehemiah chapter 9 and some of the other uh, chapters, if you read through the entire book, because sometimes it's important, I, I, I draft the series based on the entire uh, narrative that was written by uh, Nehemiah. And we looked at some very significant and important uh, words or, or statements or how this old chapter was structured from the fact of Nehemiah hearing about the walls broken down in Jerusalem, his prayer, which was focused on praying for the sins of the fathers, which had affected um, the, 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 the life of the Israelites. Because you got to understand, amen, there are generational blessings or curses that are passed on from one generation to another. And you may take this lightly, but there are things within your life that could affect the way you live and how you manifest. Not because you are guilty of initiating that particular issue, but because of what is passed down from a generations before you. So you got to understand then that um, you, you, you've got to be careful and not take for granted the things that you see happening in your life because you may not be the guilty one who initiated this, but you may be the recipient of the deluge that is passed down because of this generational sin and curse. Now, Israel was in a position where their wall was broken down, the wall that surround the city. We tried to uh, make it clear the necessity of walls because a perfect wall is an environmental separator. It has to keep the outside out and the inside in. So walls are so necessary in order to keep environmental uh, challenges out. Attack, there are attacks coming on and we've got to keep it out. It's the very same thing with the church. There are elements that are coming in the church that is causing the church to seem as if it's failing. But we know that the church is not failing. Praise God. We know that the church will stand predominantly, praise God, and will survive the onslaught of the enemy because the Lord declares upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So therefore, we, we, we looked at the various levels and layers that are necessary on the walls to keep out the environmental uh, enemies of the church. 
the doctrines, the bricks, the very nature of the bricks, or more so, this wall in Jerusalem was built by stones, according to Nehemiah chapter 4. So stones are the perfect structure, or the perfect um, entity that, that had to be used, uh, or material rather, material that has to be used in order for this wall to be what it ought to be. Because while we can look at bricks as being uh, just falsified because it's an imitation of the real thing, we know that stones are the real thing that God has used to build the very church upon. The Lord said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we are cognizant of the very necessity of choosing the stones that must build this wall. These stones represent truth. Jesus Christ is the rock, and we know that he is truth. So when we speak of those stones that build the walls, we must consider the significance of truth. You cannot use any and everything, and that's why if we're thinking about the building of the wall, we're thinking more about stones than we're thinking of bricks, because bricks are man-made. Even though they are built to certain standards and specification, but there are bricks that can be built in a way that, that accommodates the concept of someone. And bricks, if not built correctly, can be porous or something can be wrong with it that eventually it will allow the walls to collapse. We see in Miami, Florida, just a few uh, weeks ago, over 40, over nearly uh, 21 days ago, that a whole condominium was j just break apart and fall killing uh, uh, supposedly over a hundred people. Now, here is the thing, that because bricks are man-made, they can ultimately fall. But when you speak of stones, stones are created by God. So their, 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 their ability to withstand the elements is more guaranteed than a brick that is made by man. So when we look at the subject and the necessity of the walls, the wall around Jerusalem signifies its protection, keeping the outside out and keeping the inside in. Yet on this wall were gates. Ah, I, I may speak on the gates just to give you clarity on, on the structure that Nehemiah built. Amen. But what Nehemiah did, and as I bring this to this point, is to make you understand that what Nehemiah did after the wall was built was to initiate, amen, social, economic, and spiritual reform. But this was not possible. Zerubbabel and Ezra and the rest of folks who were, amen, out there were not able to bring about a, a strong spiritual reform. They were not able to bring about, amen, social and economic reform because the walls were broken. They were exposed. They were vulnerable. The enemy had them under scrutiny because you know that Sambalat and Tobiah, amen, they were out to them. They, they, they laughed at them. They, they thought they would never survive. And when the walls are not up, they praise God. The Bible says, amen, in, 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 in the Proverbs, that he that have no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is, that is broken down and without walls. So you have no control. When your walls are broken, you're vulnerable to the enemy. You're vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. They can, you, all that you do is exposed to the enemy. Now, what the church of Jesus Christ needs are walls that are built to specification. 
uh, because we cannot have no, I don't matter how the people of God pray. I don't matter what they try to say. I don't matter how they fast. We will never see a reformation, praise God, of, of the entire structure of the church. Pastors and bishops who will listen to this broadcast, we will never, ever see strong spiritual reformation in the body of Christ until the walls are rebuilt, we have to build it with the stones. The stones represents truth. We've got to use truth. We cannot use just any and anything because there are those who are using their man-made initiative and their man-made material to build the church. When I look at some who are trying to uh, uh, propagate that the church can be thus and thus. I, I have to stand as a watchman on the wall and I've got to be warning the body of Christ to be aware of these overnight phenomena who have not gone back to the word of God to make sure that we're building right. Now, I just wanna note this carefully. Before I go back to the book of Nehemiah, Paul said in Ephesians 2, verses 20 to 22, Paul wrote, We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself. I want you to take your highlighter and I want you to highlight the fact that Jesus Christ himself is being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building, amen, fitly framed together, grow it up, unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. But note carefully that Jesus Christ himself, and that's why I unequivocally speak on the Christocentric gospel. I don't preach any other gospel. I don't preach an apostolic gospel. I don't preach a Pentecostal gospel. I don't preach any other gospel. I preach unequivocally a, a Christocentric gospel because Jesus Christ himself is the foundation. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Amen, praise God, for neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none of the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's not an if and or but. There is only one name by which you can be saved. And it's not apostolic. It's not Pentecostal. It's not Trinitarian. It's the name of Jesus Christ. If you don't preach Jesus Christ, you are preaching another gospel. You are using falsified information. You are guilty of pulpit felony because you're committing a crime. You are past a misdemeanor. You are, are committed pulpit felony by preaching another gospel other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anybody want to tell you this is any other gospel? I'm warning you because other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that's according to 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay. This is not, though we're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophet, but notice that Jesus Christ himself, I know Paul didn't just say uh, the apostles, prophets, and Jesus Christ, but he said the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He is the structure or he is the foundation and the pillar on which every 
part of the structure is fitly framed together and grow it up into a holy temple. So we've got to be focused, and I preach this unequivocally, unapologetically, that there is no other gospel. It's time the body of Christ start using the name because the Bible said God has highly exalted him according to Paul's letter to the Philippians and has given him a name that is above every other name. The name of Jesus Christ is the only name that has the capacity to eradicate sin, as I just made mention from Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4. Don't preach any other gospel. Don't talk about any other gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said in to the, if, to the Galatians, though we or an angel from heaven should preach unto you any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be a curse. As I said before, so say I now again. If any man preach unto you any other gospel, let him be a curse. So we, we're going back to the scriptures of the without walls. Without walls, the church will not see, amen, its social, economic, and spiritual reformation. So, but here, here is what, here is what I want to put in your mind before I get to the scripture. I want every person online to listen carefully. I want every brother, every sister, every pastor, every bishop who will listen to this word today. I want you to get this clear in your mind so that you may understand the premise on which I'm building this message from the word of God. We're not here to fight what others are doing. Listen to me carefully. We're here to be the guide and the conscience. We don't have time to go fight with them. You will see when Nehemiah says to Sambalat and Tobiah, we don't have time for you. We're not here, praise God, to go fight what other people are doing. Please don't get the concept in your mind that we're going to fight what they're doing. We are here to be the guide and the conscience. There is a better way to approach the gospel, to let everybody know what the gospel really is and what it is uh, uh, designed to create among us. So we have a powerful work to do. So we need, listen to me carefully, you need to hear this carefully. I, I'm submitting this to you emphatically. We need people who will stand and not fight the word. When I preach, I want you to stand with the word. You may not understand it all right now, but go to the Bible, read through the Bible as I've challenged the people of God, read through the Bible and get a clearer understanding of the word of God. So I need people, if we're going to do this, Note, when Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem and he gathered the men, the leaders, the elders together, and he went around the wall and he, he noted the, 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 the devastation of the wall, the broken down status, it was so bad. A rubbish was all over the place. And, and that you must know. There was rubbish even until the, the end of the building. There was so much rubbish. So in other words, the, the, the city was so invaded that, praise God, garbage was in there. Can you consider the fact that today we are experiencing garbage within the church? There is so much rubbish that we're hearing within the church. Somebody needs to be the guide and the conscience of the church today. As, as I, I quote again that Martin Luther had said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of our culture, but rather, and I paraphrase, I do add words to this, but rather the conscience of the culture. It must be the guide and the critic of the state, and never its tool. We should not allow the, the culture, 
We should not allow the country, we should not allow the government to use us at their tool, as their tool. But here is what Martin Luther said. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. And that's what's happening to the church. We are just considered today as a big social club that is totally irrelevant. We were not considered an essential service during the pandemic, which is an indication that we did not have to ask the government to be an essential service as the hospitals were essential services because they were, they were uh, helping those who were sick to recover from their state of sickness. If the church was at the place and the position to, to, to heal or to lay hands on people and they will be healed. Listen, I show you how the church has missed its position. When the pandemic hits, we the pastors, most of us, and I say we, were afraid to lay hands directly on those with the disease because we have no resistance. We were vulnerable as much as they were. When Israel, during the plague, they were, they were hidden under the blood. That the disease that was over Israel, Egypt, killing the firstborn, could not touch them in Goshen. But the church was not adequately sheltered. I'm not saying this wasn't designed to go that way by God, but could, could there be an a, 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 a indication that the church was so anointed that we could avoid the onslaught that was upon the church? Let me take this a little further. So it is the job then of me as the minister of the gospel to bring the church back to the center of the human race. And Martin Luther said, but we can only bring the church back to the center of the human race when we bring Jesus Christ back to the center of the church. I know you all love to talk about apostolic anointing and we love to talk about Pentecostal anointing, but I'm saying something unequivocally and emphatically to you. We need to stop them slogans and use the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above every other name. I know not everybody want to hear this, but I'm up in your face that we need to get away from these slick cliches and, and spiritual jargons and use the name of Jesus Christ because God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name, that at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Stop using those Jesus only and Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and all kind of names. Use the name of Jesus Christ. Don't tell me I have an apostolic anointing. The only way I can initiate and say this, that I have an apostolic anointing is if I'm uh, uh, anointed to operate in the office of an apostle. If you are not anointed to operate in the office of an apostle, you don't have an apostolic anointing. I'm talking about the walls. Without walls, there is no certainty of doctrine. There is no certainty of truth. Nobody is, 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 is uh, uh, careful to make sure that we keep the doctrine of Jesus Christ straight. So we've got to set this. Paul and Nehemiah went back and Nehemiah would not be rested. According to Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15 to 16, it reads, So the wall was finished in the twenty. And fifth day of the month of Elul, 
in 50 and two days, underline those words, in 52 days, and it came to pass that when all our enemies, listen carefully now, when all our enemies heard thereof, amen, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of God. They realized, even though they were fighting it, Gershon, hallelujah, uh, Sambalat, Tobiah, all of them, they thought that this was just a Nehemiah phenomena. I know most of you think this is just a Bishop Johnson's phenomena. And because I don't have a lot of men around me preaching this the way it ought to be preached, because so many of us have become wimps and, and has become men pleasers and we want to look a certain way. But I am unequivocal about preaching the necessity of using the name Jesus Christ as the source of my deliverance. <laughs> I feel like getting up all deep up in your face today. Hallelujah to God. So as I made mention, come on somebody, you're going to be with me today, that there was a social and economic and, and a spiritual reformation. So go with me, if you will, over to, I'm not going to read all of it, but I give you the reference that you can go back and you can read. So go with me, praise God, to Nehemiah chapter 8. Up to the uh, finishing of the wall, because we notice we just read in Nehemiah chapter 6, praise God, and verses, amen, uh, 15 and 16, we just read that, praise God, the walls were finished. Truth was set up. But there was something more significant. That might seem as if it's a physical wall. But the Bible said here in Nehemiah chapter 8, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man. Listen to me carefully. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man. I want you to touch somebody and tell them we got to work as one man. Work as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they speak unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses. So you see, that was one aspect of the work to rebuild the wall. But now they have to go to the law which the Lord had commanded. They needed truth. So the Bible said, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding. So what, what we're preaching, we want to know that everybody's hearing and that you have the understanding. And this was done upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was, uh, uh, let me read verse three again. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. For those of us who have a problem with long church services, they read from morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. Hello, somebody. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law, the Bible. That's what we call today the Bible. We're not just going from Genesis. We're going from Genesis to Revelation. And the Bible said in verse number four, and Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattitiah, Amen, and Shema, and uh, Ananiah, and Uriah, and Ilkiah, and Ma uh, Maaseah, praise God, let me repeat that word, Maaseah, on his right hand, and on his left hand, Pediah, Amen, Mishael, and Malachi, and Hashem, and Ashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was above all the people. And when he opened it, 
all the people stood up. That's the reverence to the word of the Lord. That's why when we're reading the Bible, this is still a principle we do in the church. When the word of God has been brought, the people stood up because they reverenced the word. These are some truth that must be brought not because your Bible is on your iPad or your phone. When the word of God has been read, I know you're not seeing the big book open before you, but it is the word of God we need in the church to still have respect to the word of God without walls. I'm telling you there are principles you must know. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, amen. Lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord uh, with their faces to the ground. And, Jesh and Jeshua uh, and, and Benai and Sherebiah, Jamim, Akub, Shabitha, Amen, Aduja, Amen, Messiah, and Kelita, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, Pelaiah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. There are those, brothers and sisters, for those of you who are running away from the work of the Lord, notice that even though Ezra stood up and read, it took these men, Jeshua and Benai and Sherebiah and Jamin and Akub and Shabbatia, Amen, and Adijah, and Messiah, and Kelita, and Azariah, and Jazabad, and Anan, and Pelaiah, and the Levites. They caused the people to understand the law. We need among us individuals who have an understanding of the word. Those are not, that are not interpreting according to their fancy because they want to interpret the word to fit their situation. I want you to base your interpretation on truth. If you base your interpretation on truth, you will never have to try to remember what you taught because there is only one truth. When you speak truth, Truth is always so relative or irrelevant or set in a way that you don't have to remember what you speak. If you tell a lie and somebody comes back to you and said, Bishop, what did you say about the scripture? I will have to try to remember what I said. But when you know that you've given the truth, there will be no conflict in my former revelation and my present revelation. There will be no problem in my former interpretation and my now interpretation. So the Levite caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. I'm going to stop at verse number eight. So they read it, they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. I want you to underline those words. So they read in the book of the law, underlined the word distinctly and they gave the sense and caused them to understand. That was where the spiritual reformation came about. Ah, so if we're going to have a, a social reformation which speaks of our attitude towards each other, amen, when you read further down, you see where Nehemiah had to rebuke the elders in Israel because the elders were usurping authority over the poor brethren. They were taking ah, 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 money from them and charging them interest. And they were like selling their own brothers and sisters. You got to understand when you understand the law of God, the will of God and the word of God, there's going to be no maltreatment of each other. There's going to be a change in our attitude and our behavior towards each other. Because when the word is understood distinctly, when we have the sense of the word, I'll praise God and the full understanding of the word word. Brothers and sisters, there's going to 
be a different attitude. Your attitude ain't going to change outside the word. Don't tell me what you think and don't tell me what you feel. You've got to go back to the word. Don't tell me of the new age phenomena and the culture. You've got to go back to the word. It was in the word that the people may know distinctly, that the people may know, may get the sense. I want you to understand the word of God so distinctly and you have the sense of the word and the understanding of the reading. I don't want you to sit there telling me every day, Bishop, I don't understand the word. Ah, Lady Johnson just exhorted the church that if you don't go in prayer, you're going to remain in your stupor. You're going to remain without understanding. But when you get back to prayer and fasting, makashatai, you're going to begin to understand the word. God will eliminate your ignorance and your inability because don't you blame it on your, uh, your lack of capacity not to know the word. Because some folks said the King James Bible Bible is too hard to understand. That's because you're walking in the flesh. Because according to 1 Corinthians 2.14, uh, I heard when the man of God says, my God, I will requote if I made it wrong. The natural man understand it, not the things of the spirit of God because they're spiritually discerned. You cannot understand the word of God, the spiritual implications of the word of God if you're not walking in the spirit. You've got to get out of the flesh and stand in the spirit. So after they read the word, we forego the other verses in chapter 8. But the Bible said in chapter 9 of Nehemiah, now in the 20th and the 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and with earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. If you stay in the crowd, you will not get repentance. My God, my God, I feel something here. The children of Israel, for them to get the full understanding, for them to get a clarity of the word, the children of Israel assembled themselves in fasting and with sackcloth and with earth upon them. And the Bible said, and the seed of Israel, those who are in the church, I'm tired of you mixing church with the world. I'm tired of you, praise God, telling me that it's okay to do so and so. They separated themselves. It was the very same thing when Jacob was going up to make sacrifice after he returned from pain and errand. And Jacob was taking his family to make sacrifice. They put away every ungodly thing from among them. And they went up to make sacrifice before God. The Bible said the children of Israel separated themselves from the strength and that's when they stood up and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to get this right, we need to separate ourselves from the ungodliness of the ungodly. We need some saints who will step away from the worldly stuff, from the strangers among you, from your ungodly family and friends and get in the presence of God so that we can confess our sins and our iniquities and the sins of our fathers. The Bible said in verse number three of chapter nine, and they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God, one fourth part of that of the day. For those of you who just want to come to church and you're still hooked on a lot of stuff, Right now you're sitting in your house, but you're paying attention to all sort of stuff. You're not focused on the will and the purpose of the Lord. 
But the children of Israel, they came and they stood up for a quarter of the day and another fourth part they confessed and they worshiped the Lord their God. The Bible said they stood up on the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua and Benai and Kadmiel and Shebaniah and Bunai and Sheribiah and Benai and Shemani and cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. The Bible said said the Levites. We need some Levites in the house. Uh, Jeshua and Cadmiel and Benai kept a repetition of their name. And Hashabaniah and Sherebiah and Adijah and Shebaniah and Pethahiah and stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever and bless me the glorious name which exalted above all all blessings and praise. Let me tell you something. If the walls are rebuilt, if the law of God is understood, and if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, there is going to be a blessing. The Lord said to Moses, Go with me, brothers and sisters. Why we need to rebuild truth. Why we need to have a sure foundation over there. Hallelujah. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Bible said, and it shall come to pass that if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which he have commanded thee this day that the Lord thy God shall set the eye above all nations of the earth and he shall and these blessings brothers and sisters the Lord is about to bless us but we've got to separate ourselves and be bounded by truth we're not talking now about a physical wall but without walls we have no control over what we do but we need to rebuild the structure of truth we need to rebuild build to ward off the elements from the outside or creeping in on the inside. Oh God, I feel something in this place. So the Bible says, I shall set thee high above all nations of the earth and these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Brothers and sisters, we're about to be known. Ah, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall thou be in the city. Blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. We have been preaching today and praying for the fruit of your body. Your children are cursed. I'm going to say like it, I-T-I-S. Our children are cursed because we have not confessed the sins, our sins, and the sins of our fathers others show the fruit of our womb, our womb and our loins. They're not blessed. There needs to be repentance and confession for the wrongs we have done and our parents, the fathers of our children, the mothers of our children, their, 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 their heinous sins have attacked our children. Our children cannot be blessed because generational curse is passed upon them. My God, your children won't get saved until we in the church get together and confess that my husband was a wrong man. My wife was a wrong man. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I was wrong to pick that man because God warned me not to pick him. <laughs> God, I'm sorry. <laughs> I made that mistake <laughs> because my God, they, that man's grandmother <laughs> and the grandfather was a hobby man. <laughs> they were wicked. <laughs> 
And because of that, my sons and my daughters are wicked because a generational curse has been passed down of my shatakato shanda. You have been mixed up with obya. You have been mixed up with iniquity. You still wear a chain to tie somebody. You still have horseshoe on your door. You still carry a penny in your wallet which was given to you by a hobby man and a soothsayer. But get before the Lord because if you don't obey and do the will of the Lord, your, these curses are going to come upon you. But the Lord said, if you listen to me, the fruit of your body shall be blessed and the fruit of the ground shall be blessed and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall be where blessed shall thou be when thou comest in. And when thou shalt go out, the Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. I say goodbye to your enemy. The moment you start to confess, tell your enemy goodbye. Tell Sister Sofut, tell them goodbye. Tell Mother Jenita, goodbye. Tell Sister Kovichos, goodbye. Because your enemy that rise up against thee shall be smitten before thy face. The psalm is said, a thousand shall fall at thy side. I wish I had some worshipers in here. I wish I had some praises in here. And 10,000 at thy right hand. But they shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Your enemy gonna fall. They gonna be smitten before thy face and shall come out against thee in one way, but they shall flee in seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouse and in all that thou settest thy hands to do. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord. What's that name? Lord Jesus Christ. What's that name? Shout the name of Jesus Christ. And they shall be afraid of us. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle. None of our children will be barren. None of our endeavors will be stagnant. The Lord going to bless you. <laughs> the Lord's going to lift you up. Slap somebody and tell them I'm blessed already. <laughs> I'm blessed already. The devil is a liar. If you're not making it, stand up before the Lord and confess your sin. Stand up before the Lord and confess your iniquity. Confess the wickedness of your grandmother, your grandfather, your grand, great, grand, grand, grand. Confess it because generational curses must stop now. In the name of Jesus. My God, how many of us are serious about it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bible said, The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. The heaven will give thee rain unto the land in his season uh, to bless all the works of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head. Somebody said, I am the head. <laughs> and not the tail. I'm tired of our children working for people and not working as a head and not the tail. I want you to get out and go study and be blessed and thou sh he shall make us the head and not the tail and we shall be above only and thou shall not 
be beneath. And if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee today to observe and to do them. Verse number 14 closes this section and said, and thou shalt not go aside of, from any of the words. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me, church? Because a, a lot of us have our own interpretation. You're going to get off this line and you're going to sit down and make your own selfish, self-centered, humanistic interpretation of the word. Mm. Yes. But if thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. God says, I'm going to bless thee. This reformation will not happen. For those of us who want to know what will happen if you don't, read from verse 15 onward. If the walls are not set again, if truth has not returned to the church, too many pulpit felons, they have passed the stage of a misdemeanor. They are now felonies. They have, they have lied. They have murdered us. They have preached wrong doctrine to build denominations and to build organizations and chop us in a religious lie. But thanks be to God, Nehemiah went and rebuilt the wall. And I praise God, Ezra read the word distinctly and gave them the sense and caused them to understand the word. The word of God is to you, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, enough is enough. Too much lies. The walls have been broken. It's time to rebuild the walls. The walls, the stones, they represent truth. They represent our ultimate protection from the elements of sin and deception. The wall represents our only security from the onslaught of the prince of Persia, from the sin, the strong man, the demonic attack and diabolical forces that are legislated against the church. Brothers and sisters, as I made mention earlier in my word that we have a powerful work to do, so we need people who will stand and not fight the word, who will not turn to the right or turn to the left. Stop using your humanistic, selfish ideologies to interpret the word. Who gave you that authority? To interpret the word in such a selfish, self-centered way, just to satisfy your position. The walls... We're building the walls. I need to finish this, brothers and sisters. I need to bring this to a close. So that if we do this, we will become the conscience and the guide of our culture. It's time the church stopped being an irrelevant social club without any moral or spiritual authority. Everybody been crying, why isn't the church an essential service? Because we were living a lie. We have become an irrelevant social club. I told somebody, I said, God don't need us to be in fellowship. He wants us to be in unity. He wants us to come together, eradicate denominationalism. That that, that, that brainwashed individual who has been trying to fight me that I've left the foundation, which I rebuke by the blood and the authority of Jesus Christ, that I've divorced, I've totally separated myself from denominations. I am preaching Jesus Christ and him alone crucified. And that's why I unequivocally declare that being the church of Jesus Christ is not a denominational name. 
I want us to separate ourselves from the concept of denomination. And I want us to begin to focus on being who we are called to be, the church, the ecclesia, which is called out for Jesus Christ and him alone crucified. We're not apostolics. We're not Pentecostals. We're not Trinitarians. We are the church of Jesus Christ, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For God has highly exalted him and has given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's not just Jesus. He is Christ. Hello, somebody. So that's it. The walls are built. I'm, I'm establishing. And I want you to join me on our Friday sessions where I'm going to recalibrate, read distinctly, and give the meaning of of these words, that you may know the truth of the gospel and you may be able to make correct decisions. You may be able to know what you're into and why you're in the church, why Christianity is our choice and not Buddhism and not Muslim and not being a sheik or an Arab or one of those. You should know why you serve Jesus Christ. All the other gods are the works of man. But our God is the only true and living God. Though the Muslims and other religions refer to Jesus Christ as just a prophet, he is the only prophet that died and rose again the third day, which evidently then makes him God. Hello, somebody. So I want you to know today we're rebuilding the walls. And I'm inviting our brothers and sisters. I'm going to be calling on you for commitment. Not just to be a hearer, but to be a doer of the word. To stand with me as we become the critic and the conscience of our culture. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. A city that is set on an hill that cannot be in. May you be tremendously blessed today, saints. And those who have listened and will listen to this broadcast, let me say thank you for taking the time. Don't just start it and not finish it. Go through this entire message. If you missed any part of it, go back to our various platforms under the Church of Jesus Christ Canada. Re-listen to all that God is saying to the church like it, subscribe to it, share it globally. Let everybody know the truth is here again. I'm your neighborhood pastor, Bishop Double O Anthony Johnson. Amen, here just for the truth, not by power or by might, but thank God for the spirit of Almighty God. May you be blessed and may you experience that supernatural anointing of the power of the Holy Ghost. May this week be your best week. May this week allow you to, to experience all that God has in store for you. Things are opening up. I want to make sure you're secured. For those who are afraid of the vaccine, amen. If you know you have a, 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 a special anointing for that, then stay unvaccinated. For those who know that you're human and there is a bomb in Gilead, Go take this vaccine so that you will not be infected. And I'm not forcing anybody. I'm just submitting to you that that's the right thing to do. May you be blessed today. May you experience Jesus Christ like never before. Because in him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. Have a blessed and godly week in Jesus Christ's precious name. Thank you, saints, for your love, your patience in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ.